Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on that note, as we now begin uh, with the formal proceedings of this uh, evening, uh, we are joined by Mr. Anand Goenka, who is the whole time director and head new media with the Express Group. In fact, a Dean Scholar in Print Journalism from the Annenberg School of Journalism in Los Angeles. He oversees the Express Group's business uh, publications division as well as the online division. Most importantly, under his leadership in the year 2014, the Indian Express was recognized with a silver trophy for the best news website in Asia by the World Association of Newspapers and gold for social media in the year 2012. So let's have a huge round of applause and please help me welcome on stage Mr. Anand Goenka. Ladies and gentlemen, very warm welcome to Jaipur and welcome to our first Technology Senate in the last uh, five and six years that we moved it back into India. So very warm welcome to Jaipur and um, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm, I think most of you all are quite well uh, aware of the Express Computer Magazine, but we were the first, I just quickly take a few seconds of yours to just go through what we've been up to uh, the last 20, 21 years uh, in this space. Um, Express Computer was the first magazine to talk to CIOs. Um, and we're sort of continuing that journey of being uh, innovators in the communication space uh, to sort of reach and address need gaps uh, in, in the content space that there is right now and with a focus on technology. Um, we were the first to uh, start doing CIO events. Uh, in 2004, we had 200 CIOs from across India, the finest CIOs in the country, sort of meet in Kochi. Um, the, we have taken technology, send it to cruise liners, we have taken it outside of India, last year was in Malaysia, uh, and now we're bringing it back very much, very much bringing it back into India. Um, we have the first to start recognizing CIOs, we have the Express Intelligent Enterprise Awards, Express Security Strategist Awards, and the Express Uptime Champion Awards. Um, Consistently, I think uh, we believe at the Express Group that the IT community is going to be, and already is, and is going to be even more, a huge driver uh, and a big engine of our uh, of our country's uh, growth in the next coming in the next coming ten years. So, um, so that's why we're here. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, with us. The one person who we need to thank a lot to be here today uh, is uh, the Technology Senator of the Year. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Thakkar, uh, when, I, when, we, when we announced that, uh, we didn't actually formally quite announce it because we didn't quite get a formal confirmation until about five or six days ago. Um, and I'm going to keep telling him that. But um, Mr. JT, as we all know in the, in the community, um, when, I, when we started discussing that he's going to be coming, all the response I got from my friends here was, Really, J really, JTR, really, like, you know, it was like this sort of uh, the, the very elusive JT is here. So uh, it's with a very, very uh, warm heart that we're all welcoming him here. The Technology Senator of the Year Award uh, is to recognize and honor significant achievements and contributions over a sustained period of time in the area of large scale technology deployment by an individual within the private sector or government. This popular award is decided by a team of editorial people from the Indian Express Group who covered the IT industry and business trends driven by IT. These are people who have been doing this business for the last 20, 25 years. Um, and looking at all the kind of work that's happened, um, I think the Reliance Geo implementation has been the most, is one of the most eagerly awaited uh, launches uh, in, in, in modern India. Um, Geo promises to revolutionize the way common people would communicate and use data. With the simple vision of providing affordable data connectivity, the scale and complexity of the project started right from the choice of the correct technology to go with and then build a, ne a nationwide network. The number of products that go within the network, the different vendors to negotiate and work with, and then finally roll out the project with a massive team of internal and vendor people ensured that this project was unanimously selected for the award. The award is testimony to the skill, vision, and ability of the man behind it, the man who rises when the moment demands it, and whose performance and delivery demands that he be called the Technology Senator of the Year. 
Um, so really quickly, if I can, if you could all please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Jyotinder Thakkar of Reliance Geo. Um, please come on stage and receive this small token of appreciation from the Express Group. <laughs> Call you JTG on stage or JT is okay. Uh, no, I'll ask you JTG. I was, I was just what, I was worried you're going to ask me to use the full name, so I would say no. Uh, so JTG, why so elusive? Firstly, a lot of people wonder basically why I don't attend because a lot of people try to make their resumes more glamorous by basically putting it on Google and all that, and they would like to change jobs every three years. I have been wedded to Reliance for the last quarter century, so I don't need to physically be there everywhere and finally we have been buying technology from all the vendors that you have talked about and basically we that. Most of them do visit us, we visit their offices, we visit their labs many times. So I don't think basically going to occasions like this becomes very easy for us to basically be there, you know. And once I enter, all vendors will pile on you, so it's very difficult to undo them, you know. <laughs> and so it becomes much easier not to be there, you know. But my team members do come in many events, you know, in a very quiet way and they do really evaluate technologies many times. But uh, JDG, well, I would like to ask you a little bit about, uh, you know, you, you said you've been at Reliance for, for 25 years now almost. Right. Um, and you're right, there is no resume of your, I've, I've looked a lot for research, there was nothing on you uh, for a really long time. I mean, I, we know we know the Geo, we know the Reliance Com, and then uske pehle, I don't know what happened. So, um, so just take us a little bit about sort of how you got into this business, how you got into technology, and what sort of keeps driving you still. It's a long story, basically we can start from the beginning, right from the time when I was in school and I just gave and then basically a glimpse of how I got into IIT, which is itself a very interesting phenomenon. Um, I used to study in Don Bosco School in Bombay, did um, senior Cambridge over there. That was the only year where Don Bosco went to senior Cambridge. And for some reason or the other, we didn't study. A couple of us were there who didn't study at all. And we flunked basically, or we basically got very less marks, you know. So I got about 40, 52 percent basically. And so it was very difficult to even think of what will be the next career path, you know. And those days basically either your son will either become an engineer or a doctor. There was no other third kind of profession that any parent would think of. So in my family basically my father has five brothers. All five of them were in business. He was the only one who studied. He was a lawyer by profession. So I had no other choice but to not go any other family business. I had to also study. So I went 52%. There was no choice to do anything else. I basically then joined Agrawal classes in a manner that was again a very difficult one and basically studied very hard for three, four months. Got flying colors, got into IIT, joined IIT Kharagpur and basically that's where I was basically into technology. No, but how did the Agarwal classes piece is the exciting part of the story. So you have to tell us a little bit how you got into Agarwal classes. So Agarwal classes for all those people who know in Bombay is one of the most recognized classes of those days in 75 and 80, which were well known for basically joining IIT entrance exam. If you get into Agrawal classes, quite likely that you have basically at least done good job. And then basically you get into IIT, quite likely that you will make it. But 52 percent Agrawal classes will not even entertain you. So I went to basically cry and saying that, sir, I need to be there because all my friends are there and stuff like that. Fortunately, one of my friends from Don Bosco, Mr. Paramjit Singh, who is a Sardarji by nature, by birth, basically came over there because his father said, I don't want you to do IIT, why are you wasting your time and all that, why don't you join commerce? So he came over there fortunately to basically give his, this thing saying, I want my money back. I, that fellow said that no, we can't give money back. So I said, don't worry, you come outside, we went downstairs, I told him, I'll pay you all the money that you require for your this thing, you don't worry, you continue and you don't worry about this. I joined Agrawal classes as Paramjit Singh for three and a half months, studied very hard basically for the IIT entrance exam and basically that flying colors, you know, Agrawal classes and that's what. I studied almost 12 hours in a day continuously doing all homework, everything and then just changed completely, you know. 
my father was completely dejected when I got 52 percent. So that that trauma that I saw in his face basically made me do things which were basically completely different. So many times when you fail somewhere, you need to really rise fast. You don't need to basically feel that there is no end of it. And I think I basically made it into that. That's how the IIT thing happened. Very interesting. So today, uh, I mean, the, rep the reputation that you have is one of sort of a master negotiator. Uh, I, I mean, the person that sort of, you know, one should learn negotiation from. So a little bit about sort of, uh, I mean, so first do you accept that title of the master negotiator? No, I don't think I am a master negotiator. I always feel whenever I finish a deal, I have left something on the table, I could have got something more. So that's the feeling I always get whenever I basically commit a deal, you know. But the time is always there and you're always under pressure in reliance to basically close deals fast enough. So sometimes you feel they have done good, but you always feel that basically there. While I don't know how this impression has happened that I'm a master negotiator. But it's very much there. But so there's one thing about reliance that keeps coming and you're a pillar of reliance that, um, you know, somehow in terms of project delivery, uh, whatever, whatever task there is, when it's an engineering sort of task at hand, the speed and the efficiency at which it works at Reliance, uh, somehow it just, you know, it's, it's far superior to anything else that the private sector or government sector in India has seen. One example, one of my favorite examples is in Jamnagar. I believe there is a sea link Correct. In, that, in, in, in the Jamnagar area, which is four times longer than our Verli to Bandra sea link in Bombay. Right. A Verli to Bandra sea link in Bombay took 10 years to complete. You took one and a half years. Absolutely. So, a little bit of sort of, you can teach us a little bit, teach me and teach everybody else here sort of how, what is the secret to making things work so, so fast? Just to give you a story behind the sea link, because I don't know if anybody has told you or not, but for all those people who are not, so we had almost completed the refinery. And um, I'm talking about, we were about six months away before completing the refinery. And this vendor whom we had given this particular order to basically create this 11 kilometer worth of particular ceiling failed. He said, I cannot do this. I want price escalation. I want this and that, you know. And so we had to basically go ahead, renegotiate the contract. A team flew from India to Dubai, negotiate the contract, redid this thing, and then basically asked him to basically at the enhanced price. It was still cheaper for us to basically do it rather than not do it and do it for three years or change the contractor. So we actually paid the extra price, but we got it done. And they came in over here. It was all made in there in Dubai, then just got plonked in over here in one and a half years. So unlike what the ceiling which you see in Bombay, which was actually constructed on site, these were all basically parts which were basically constructed off site and then got into this. As far as the engineering excellence is concerned, basically of Reliance, as to why we do projects fast enough is, first, I think we spend a hell of a lot of time in basically planning, planning, planning. Sometimes you get crazy, you know. Why are we doing so much of planning and why are we doing engineering again and all that? But I think what Mukesh Bhai loves is basically get that 80% right, get the 85% right, and then order the, all the materials that are required for 85%. Even if you go 100, I mean, slightly wrong, doesn't matter. So if you're trying to do a large project like a refinery, which is costing you five, six billion dollars, you at least end up doing four and a half billion dollars worth of material procurement because the procurement of that material itself, lead time to manufacture is also very long. So you need to basically be 80% right, you get it done, and then basically the 15-20% that you keep refining, you will end up doing a refinery which otherwise would have costed you five and a half billion dollars, costed us six billion dollars. But in the time frame that you see, we have done much better. The second thing I would like to say is that when we did the first refinery in Jamnagar, I remember very clearly, we were in 95-96 when we just started thinking about the refinery. Reliance did not even have a video conferencing system then. We used to go from Maker Chambers for our head office, go to Mr. VSNL's office over there, do a video conferencing from there with potential suppliers of refinery and Mukesh Bhai, Anil Bhai they used to travel at that point in time to the VSNL towers just to do video conferencing and we could get basically various deals. We were thinking that time to do a six million ton refinery. The largest refinery at that point in time in India was basically the Mathura refinery which was about six million tons. And that particular refinery in time frame if you see had taken six years, seven years to even build the refinery, again two years to do startups and all that. So you're like scared that basically we have to put a 6 ton refinery and we have to stop for 7 years, what will happen? But we went through the engineering, we appointed Bechtel as our full-time consultants. 
we went from a 6 million ton to a 9 million ton to a 15 million ton refinery when we started placing all the orders for all the refinery material, you know. By the time we actually did the final engineering and did the final work, we actually ended up doing a 27 million ton refinery. So the whole plant that we created was a 27 million ton refinery, but we kept on engineering and engineering. And then we started ordering the moment things were perfect. You need this, you boiler, you tank, so we got it done. For all those people who have not visited Jamnagar, you should actually come and see it. There are 150 tanks, each tank made of steel, larger than the size of a football field. So if you think of a football field, how big it is, how big it is, 150 tanks we have created over there in record amount of time. That time welders are not available in India. How did we basically create welders? We used to run a welders training school just outside Jamnagar. We used to train people up. After they got trained, we used to say, now you'll get a job over here, provided you get certified. We used to have actually welder testing done. Once a welder passes to that particular test, then only we used to give him a job in Reliance, you know. So those are the kind of things. Because most of the welders, if you see, are all working in Saudi Arabia. Because that's where most of the refinery expansions, most of the chemical plant expansions happened. And I can never afford to basically pay dollars salaries or basically dirham salaries to basically do refinery in India. So there was no other shortcut to basically do that, you know. So a lot of things like that we did basically to achieve um, success in project management, refinery is concerned. You know. But you've gone from, I mean, re re refinery is one thing, but you were also involved in plastics. Yes, basically. I mean, I'm, I've been lucky enough to basically be involved. I consider Reliance basically in this last 25 years has done many revolutions, you know. You can talk about it. I can talk about at least few revolutions that I know of. So refinery is one thing basically. So you feel so proud, basically talking to your children or talking to your friends, that every third aeroplane that is flying in this country uses Reliance aviation turbine fuel. Every fourth truck that basically goes on this road of India basically uses diesel from Reliance, you know. What more do you, what more satisfaction can you get? Basically, you have changed the face of this country as far as that is concerned. Same thing we have done in plastics. If you see plastic revolution that India brought, when I studied in IIT, we used to basically have metal buckets. Most of you might not have seen metal buckets in your lifetime, but if you have seen them, those were the buckets that we used to use. Today, can you please find one metal bucket in your lifetime? You will not be able to see anywhere in India. Most of us use plastic buckets. How did that revolution occur? That revolution occurred because Reliance got into plastic. Today, we are the largest producers of plastic in India, fourth largest in the world. And that's how basically we brought these capacities to international scale at price points which are basically affordable to India. Every plastic bottle that you drink water from, whether it's a Bistleri, whether it's an Equafina, whether it is basically Himalaya or any other brand that you take in, the plastic that bottle that uses is basically Reliance, you know. That means just like Intel inside, Reliance is there in inside every plastic bottle or every plastic element that you see in this country. Whether it's a water tank, whether it's a plastic bottle or any other pipe that you see in this country. The plastic that is used is primarily Reliance. 70% of India's plastic market we own. So that's how basically the revolution has occurred, you know. So plastic revolution, refining revolution, we did textile revolution, which is the case study is so famous that Dhirubhai Ambani was called the polyester king in India, right? Every cloth, every pant shirt that you're wearing today basically has polyester, which is coming from Reliance, you know. Whatever the brand name that you buy, Big Jam, Raymond, doesn't matter, you know. So you've jumped, if you, well, jumped in the sense that you've been in different industries, right, right. as a CIO. So a little bit of advice here for some of the CIOs who are visiting, sort of what's the... What are the kind of, uh, so today, today's modern CIO, what are the kind of skills you think that he should be uh, learning him, uh, learning or, or sort of improving for himself or herself? My personal feeling is basically keep the management out of the technology decisions and make decisions on your own and be convinced about it and prove it to them fast enough, you know. If they start getting involved in technology, you'll never be able to decide, you know. So, and make sure that you always talk to them about business. Sincerely, because half knowledge is no knowledge, you know. So I, I feel very fortunate that in my case, basically, Mr. Ambani had a lot of faith in us, basically, that we used to be allowed to buy any technology that we wanted at whatever price that we wanted. They knew that they had the confidence that these guys will not blow up the money unnecessary. And we do a lot of experiments. It's not that what you see is basically successful. I do a lot of experiments. We have a lab over there which keeps trying out various technologies. And many times we do try out and we succeed, sometimes we don't succeed. But I think now we have got perfected this art in the last 25 years that I think it has become more of a nature, you know. But, uh, okay, so, so you got, a, you got an ovation for that. So obviously you, 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 what you're seeing is resonating with a certain, a certain part of the audience. 
but you know uh, sort of going forward what we're also hearing is that the role of the CIO itself is being questioned in the sense that each department whether it's a marketing whether it's HR whether it's whatever it is whether it's a, a manufacturing each department needs to have that it, the the CIO skill set in sort of in depth in that particular department itself so do you feel like this role of a group CIO sort of is somehow over in the long run going to be a little bit questioned I We're think 15 20 years but you know yeah yeah my personal feeling is um, see a lot of companies basically say technology is good and basically would love to have it and basically do it but on the other side when you actually go on doing it they actually outsource the technology they go and give it to or I don't want to take any names but you give it to an Infosys or a Wipro or somebody like that and you say that basically you're a technology company you know I don't think so if Reliance basically wants to use technology then it better be doing it on its own so we have always cultivated this art of thing basically right from the help desk down to basically any technology that we want to implement we would love to do it first on our own and basically make sure that it is perfect rather than basically let the vendor run at our expense you know and that's the model that we have always followed and if you really want to implement technology and take value out of technology and take advantage out of it you should basically make your hands dirty you should basically allow people to basically do it and you should not outsource as much as possible that's the feeling I feel you know you talk about efficiency Sorry, you want to say? and you talked about basically the departmental CIOs and all that so earlier the same problem happened with HR when HR departments basically started expanding then everybody said I also need an HR and all that so then that thing came up that you will now be a business HR that means you will correspond to them but the central policies will be done and so people used to be allowed to basically keep a business HR will follow it with you so I think in IT also you can basically create an IT relationship manager or stuff like that with various departments but in Reliance what we have done is that we have dominated basically centrally we have defined these are the policies that every department will follow whether you are from whichever business group that you have there will be some things which will be unique to your business and we are allowing you to basically do it and you your IT can basically decide as long as it follows the corporate policies you know but we keep a centralized procurement so the procurement and negotiations of all the technologies whichever department and conglomerate you may be is still done centrally so that we at least know that we are not making a fool of ourselves by buying Oracle from this fellow at this price and the other CEO is buying at a different price. But for a smaller company, uh, you know, I mean, after, you're, you're That's a, very right. company, but if you take a very small company, you know, maybe like a 50, 60 crore right. startup kind of a company, not a startup, but to a certain like, small, medium companies, for them, the CIO might not then be, you know, in this setting, the one that you're suggesting. I think basically you'll still require, so there was a very classic case basically, should technology companies have a people lead the technology companies who are technology savvy so say for example Google they basically were debating for many months and year now basically whether sh they should basically get a C CEO from an outside company and basically make him or should they basically grade somebody who understands technology I think they have done a great decision by basically promoting somebody internally who understands technology and business as equally good you know because to run a as complex a technology as Google if you basically have a person who comes from outside and is just a business CEO typically what happened to Apple Steve Jobs basically in hindsight if you see got a guy who was extremely good at marketing and sales but was a failure in running Apple at all so I think technology companies have to be run by technology so if you say that Reliance is a technology company in that case then it has to be managed people so that's why I think Mukesh Ambani is a good mix of technology and commercial if you see basically because he understands and goes deep into reading everything tries to understand everything the latest buzzword in our company is no SQL databases you know I'm sure all of you basically who understand databases is now no SQL databases so he also wants to understand how do we basically go about doing those things you know very interesting so uh, your view also isn't influenced by the fact that the new CEO of Google is from your college yeah I mean very lucky to basically see an alma mater Flynn fellow basically who is becoming the CEO of Google which itself is very inspiring very very you feel very proud about it you know you mentioned uh, Reliance a company revolution so we'll just get to the next revolution which is Geo uh, and then we'll take a few questions from the audience I'm sure there are many but um, on Geo uh, firstly you know so secretive I mean it took years to even know what the brand name was going to be and it was decided before it came out before it came into public um, why so firstly why so secretive and the second question is 
we've been expecting this rollout now for three years. And every December we say, okay, you know, next year or next six months. So is, the, is, it, is it the biggest revolution Reliance has taken so far? Mm. So I would say basically, first let's talk about the timeline issue, you know, why it is moving from year to year or something. So we did take a bet on basically an LTE technology in 2300, maybe 2010, 2011. And now we are in 2015, basically. We've thought that within three years, there will be handsets, there will be devices, there will be chipsets, which will basically make it up fast enough. Unfortunately, those chipsets and devices never came at a price point which Reliance wanted. On the second side, basically, we started getting auctions of basically newer and newer spectrum during that time frame. So obviously, we also started re-engineering ourselves to saying, now we have got 2300, now we are getting 1800, and now this year we bought 850. So we then had to basically buy a handset or a technology which will now support 850, 1800 or 2300 simultaneously rather than doing this. So we then approached Qualcomm who is a chipset partner and vendor and basically said that we would like to basically make this. Fortunately for us, Qualcomm also was following that particular path. And that's how basically the decision, because if you don't want to, if you want to launch a business and if you can't basically launch a business and create a large enough dent like a revolution that we would like to call it, then there's no point in doing it. Since handsets were not available, going to be available at a price point which is affordable to the masses of India, there's no sense in basically launching a business. So we thought might as well wait for one more year. So this year I think if you see all people are talking about 5,000 rupees handsets. My competition is also talking about it, 5,000 rupees handset. Yeah. So I think that is the affordable price point that people are really going to buy, you know. And you expected, you expected Airtel to preempt? We believe that they have done it, basically, they did what is right for their company. I'm sure, basically, we'll do what is right for our company and it's an open market, so we'll basically do what is right for us. You have Spectrum in 2300, 1800 and 850, I thought it was 900 and 800. So no, I, this 850 Spectrum is the, so either you call it an 800 Spectrum or you call it the 900 Spectrum. Right. So we had the 800 Spectrum, we okay. built it for the 800 Spectrum, okay. you know, okay. which is the CDMA, old CDMA right. Spectrum range, which right. is what we called it basically, you know. So you've got so three of these Spectrums. So we've got three of the Spectrums. Total, if you consider the total Spectrum that Reliance has now got, we are the largest Spectrum bank compared to any other operator in India as of today. Was that always the plan? To, or did the auctioning, the bids open up and you say, let's just also get it anyway? If you see learning lessons from Korea, learning lessons from Japan, learning lessons from USA, the only way a wireless operator can become a dominant player in this space if you have large amount of spectrum, you know. It is very difficult to basically create a network with just 20 megahertz and then say, I'll dominate this space, you know. So we had to basically go out, out pitching about it. So in our strategy, we always thought that, but we never thought that the government will auction the spectrum so fast enough. That was the only thing which we were waiting for time, you know. So you want to just quickly tell us, ki, you know, we all, we know there's a sort of whole uh, sort of bunch of apps. There are several apps uh, that are going to be in a geo device. Correct. Sort of, instead of hearing from hearsay and grapevine, what can you tell us, ki geo hai kya hai? What, what are we going to actually see in December? So I think uh, what you will see in December is, I would like to say basically you'll see an unleashing of bandwidth first. So all those people who are basically starved of bandwidth at an affordable price should see basically bandwidth. You should see devices which will be available at affordable prices. And India should basically then work on this to basically enable the startup economy. As far as our network is concerned, we wanted our network to be basically long, and we wanted to basically be complete nationwide. Number two, we just didn't want to create a dump pipe for others to come and ride on it. So we wanted to basically create some intelligence into the network. So we thought of basically creating an apps and an economy which we believe that basically will succeed in the long run because apps and bandwidth typically go together, then it can becomes a viable proposition for the end user also. So again, what are we going to see? <laughs> what are we go okay. You are want we, the apps? No, I will tell you the apps okay. because it's a no, public. No, not the apps, not the apps. But no, uh, are we going to see a, a, a cell phone? Are we going to see a tablet? Are we going to see a television? Are we going to see all three? Are we going to see a my uh, a personal Wi-Fi? Are we going to see a dongle? Are we going to see it uh, or or like a, a SIM card? So from a, from a layman, what are we going to see in December? So my mm, feeling is you will see a plethora of devices. You will see obviously SIM cards because without that phones will not work. 
you will see a MiFi device coming, a very efficient, very long battery life MiFi card you will see, and you will see dongles basically for sure. So you'll see smartphones, you'll see MiFi cards, and you'll see dongles basically for sure. You'll see tablets. Initially, we'll have Wi-Fi tablets because LTE tablets are still not that popular in the world. So people are still going in for Wi-Fi tablets, basically, you know. These are the four kinds of devices which will basically come out with you. Know? And the MiFi, uh, and the Wi-Fi tablet will work on Android or, or it will be your own? Wi-Fi tablet initially will work on Android and then later on basically on Microsoft also. On okay. Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Um, so, last question from my side and then we sort of open to the audience. One critical view or one sort of, or, or, or rather the, um, the sadistic view of the Geo rollout is that Reliance is an engineering brand, it's an engineering company, you know, you, all the revolutions you've spoken about and all the work Reliance has done has been phenomenal engineering and business work. But from a consumer facing sort of, you know, likeness and kindness of the brand, uh, you know, Reliance Fresh has been the only sort of consumer facing brand in recent times and I think only last year would, would, you, would we start calling that like a rearing success or a, or a, or a, or a mm -hmm. P&L success. Do you, does this bother you? Does this ever, does this thought ever come into the mind key saying, you know, we are doing something very different. We are now doing a consumer facing thing which we haven't done in a very long time. Sure, it is one of the um, things that my competition always wants to tell us, you know, basically because Reliance, you are an industrial company, you are a B2B brand, you are always behind, you never come in the consumer front, so basically how will you do this? I think these stories have happened to us basically many number of times. When we were in textiles, people told us don't get into petrochemicals. When we went into petrochemicals, we went to refinery, they said don't do refinery. When we went to telecom, they said don't do telecom. When we went to retail, they said don't do retail. So now they're telling us don't do consumer and we'll do consumer and we'll prove everybody wrong. You will see this will be the one of the biggest and the most respected brands going ahead in the country in 2016. All the, and good luck to you for that. Guaranteed Any questions in the you. audience? For guys, anybody? Any questions out there? Yeah, can we get a mic there please? Please introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Prasad Patil from SR. Uh, you said that, you know, you have an innovation lab and for the last 25 years, you, besides the successes that you said are more published, you also keep on testing a whole lot of things uh, in that lab. Just wanted to know that, have you put a systemic process around testing of those technologies or just you like it still to be off the cuff and uh, as someone would want to test it. No, I think we basically see problems that we are facing and trying to basically solve those problems. So it's not necessarily doing any fancy technology that I see in the world. Idea is that we continuously face problems because of a large amount of industries that we are into and then trying to solve those problems, what is the technology that we need to evaluate and continuously keep alert basically about those technologies, you know. Any other questions, guys? Do I see any? Just raise your hand. Yeah, right there, please. Did you ask a mic there? I saw a hand go up here somewhere. There you are, yeah. Hi, Ashok Kannan from Cellcom. Uh, this is regarding the uh, outsourcing or in-house model, where uh, you had mentioned that uh, mostly you're going with the in-house model. Uh, for uh, such a large scale, how do you manage the changes in technology which happen every six months or every year, the related training costs, the related upgradation costs, or sometimes hiring more resources, etc.? Very interesting question. Basically, it does uh, always bother us that why don't we basically, so let's say for example, Wipro will keep training people on a continuous basis on latest technology then, so we'll basically be able to get resources much easier. Idea is as a technology person, never go after the next fad in town. So many times we have missed revolutions in Reliance and we have never gone with the fad. We said as long as the technology is working for us, not necessarily to always go in the latest and the best, you know. And that's why we have done it. But some technologies we have always been proceeding ahead of what the market is doing, you know. And we have used technology for our productivity gains more than anything else, you know. And we have standardized, so we... That way we run a very dictatorial, so-called martial law dream, I mean, nothing allowed. This is what it is and that's it, you know, take it or leave it kind of stuff. So we don't give too much options to every department in the company. This is what it is, this is fixed. 
इसके अंदर में जो करने है करो उसके बाहर जो है दैट इज योर इंडिविजुअल डिपार्टमेंट दिस थिंग एंड वी अलाउ दैट यू नो सो आई थिंक टू मेक इट सिंपल कीप इट अदरवाइज इट्स टू डिफिकल्ट टू बेसिकली रन सच ए लार्ज कॉन्ग्लोमरेट यू नो यू गिव एवरीबडी अ डेमोक्रेटिक राइट यू नो यस प्लीज इंट्रोड्यूस योर सेल्फ आई एम मनीष कोधा फ्रॉम अदवाया so as you said you are a large conglomerate with uh, industrial companies and also now uh, primarily a technology company so being a cio of a non technology business and being a cio of a technology business is it different how different and uh, is that a friction uh, that you face there is a challenge and there is basically an opportunity if you look at it so in a let's say like the telecom g opportunity that we are rolling most of the people that we are hiring are coming from the technology industry whether it's a telecom industry whether it's a software industry whether it's a hardware industry and so a lot of people that you work with are basically coming from the same field and can talk the same lingo and the same language on the other side when i'm talking about a non technology industry most of the people whom i'm talking to are business people on the other side whom you are trying to convince why this technology is important and why you think will make productivity gains you know and over a period of time that group of people have always started respecting you saying that this fellow's decisions are always right and because the company is so large the economies of scale that we take advantage of and some of the things that you talk about we also basically beat the people on price so together i think we take advantage of both of them but obviously it is always interesting to work with a technology company yes Greeting, uh, Manish Pal from HDFC Bank. Uh, with the news coming in today, wherein RBI has granted licenses for payment banks, right? And I believe Reliance is also partnering with SBI on that. Correct. Uh, and Geo coming in the way you are saying in December, is there also a roadmap for Geo to enable the payment bank that you are getting into? I believe. as any other conglomerate we are also always op open and opportunistic to basically see what are the new trends that are happening in industry we believe today is the ripe time in india with the new governor that is ruling the bank basically the cost of basically manufacturing cash today itself is more than the cost of the cash so if that is the case the only way he can basically reduce it is if he allows digital and so he is going to encourage digital payments in a big way today is already basically in the last 3 months he has evolved legislation which says 2000 rupees and all that below you don't need to have a second factor authentication so i think there is a lot of opportunity to basically remove cash from the economy to that extent hopefully black economy also will go down and to that extent the country will prosper so we are only basically unleashing that particular revolution and this is all going to be digital money so it goes very well with what we are doing in geo so that's why we believe it's a very synergistic opportunity for us yeah so that i mean at the cost of a resumption or a guesstimation i'll take that as a yes but there's also talk about the geo wallet so why geo wallet, wallet yes so as part of the plethora of offerings which will be coming in like you said you don't you want to make it an intelligent offering is wallet also going to be part of the initial offering or will that come out later so can i ask a reverse question yes. hdfc bank basically already is a bank whatever i can do through mobile banking i could have done through mobile why did hdfc bank come through a wallet yes you right. came with chiller right yes so basically same way basically when we started one and a half or two years ago payment bank was not even in the horizon Correct. we wanted to do basically something because we are not even a bank like you so the only way out for us was to basically do a prepaid wallet and make sure that we do this in the meanwhile the revolution occurred and basically governor has now given access to us so i think we'll stop the wallet or we'll continue and make sure the payment bank becomes the predominant factor for us you know thank you right jeeji thank you so much for coming no thank problems i hope i have been able to answer and basically make sure that whoever has any other field questions basically my email address is very simple jt@rl.com as the ceo you have the advantage of basically using two letter email addresses so you can do that and take advantage of that otherwise thanks a lot for everybody and i don't think i would have been able to be here in this last 25 years without thanking my family who has been a great support for me 
my father who is now 87 years of age, more fitter than me, still practices law. My daughter whose face when I see every day in the morning a smile on her face basically re-energizes me completely. And my wife who has always been the backbone of the whole family. She has taken care of the home front, she has taken care of basically all my parents, in-laws and stuff like that and made sure that basically she grooms Namrata who is my daughter to basically a very responsible citizen and make sure that she becomes a successful professional in life. So I want to thank her and basically make sure that she always is there next to me throughout the journey. I would also like to thank the Express Group again to basically honoring me with this particular award and we look forward to basically making this India a great digital revolution. I'm sure Mr. Modi is also going to come here tomorrow, right? As he is visiting Jaipur, the pink city as you have kept it, right? Thanks again for hosting this particular event in the pink city and this was a 13th event. 13 is a lucky number for me. A lot of people feel it's unlucky. So I'm very happy and proud to be here as part of your event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.